Have you ever wondered how demons around us could separate us, divide us, and cause us woe in life? That's what we'll talk about today. Tortured fear and stupid confidence are both desirable states of mind. C.S. Lewis, The Screwtape Letters. Of course, you know, those are demons saying that. But that means for us, and for us getting closer to God, they are both terrible states. Last week, we talked about the book, The Screwtape Letters, and we're going to continue that conversation this week. If you recall, this book is about demons trying to drag us away from God, but not the way that you think, not by scary, the omen ways or Linda Blair and the exorcist ways. This is subtle. These are small little changes that these demons try to make in us to make it so that we fall away from God. He starts talking about war and how we can use war to bring us away from God. And he warns the demon that it's not helpful, as you think, to have war to take us away from God because anxiety and fear and fear for our futures often bring people to God. We've seen that in times where we have had times of great stress and trials, and it takes us closer to God. Not where the person gets so afraid they can't act, but gets so stressed out to the point where they just start focusing on other things, whether it's anger or lust or other actions that will take us away from God. But we can't get too petrified, just just a little scared. The demon points out that you can't make people too scared. You can't make them skeptics. You can't make them materialist. But what you can do is start tilting people towards the direction of emotionalism or building up science and other things to such a point where they cannot be discussed or debated. They are close to being God. We talked a little bit about that the last time. But when we have fears and stresses in our life, if we can get people, they said, built into like the physical stuff, their bodies, exercise. And there's nothing wrong with exercise. I exercise. But when you focus only on exercise and only on the physical being, and we forget about the spiritual needs of our soul, that's when they can make some real gains. So that the person is stressed and they use all these other methods to get away from that stress and then takes them eventually away from God. He says it doesn't even matter that the fact that devils are uh, what he says, quote, comic figures. You know, when we think about the devil is a guy in red tights and he has a pitchfork and he's, you know, sitting on your shoulder telling you to do the bad thing. And it's more of a joke. When he thinks about the devil, if we believe the devil is real, of course, that brings us closer to God. But if we think of the devil even as something silly, because if it's more of a concept, than it is a reality thing, that's where it drives us away from God. I knew someone who said he was a Satan worshiper before, and I asked him about it. I said, you know, but isn't it true that Satan is these bad things? And so how do you worship it? And he said, oh, it's not that we're Satanists, we're atheists. But the idea is that we're atheists in exactly the opposite direction of what Christians are. So if you say A, B, we we say B. So it's just about being opposite or contrary. And I don't know, I don't know a lot about Satanism, but if there are people who do worship Satan, it's not the majority of the people who call themselves Satan worshiper. They're just trying to be contrary to it. And that's what he's saying here. It doesn't matter if people don't believe in the devil. What matters is that they don't believe in God. They don't have to believe in the devil to get their goals. That's not what it is. And so even if they're silly, as long as they're contrary, that's all that matters. He says that one way that you can get people to get away from God is to start breaking people down into these subgroups again. We talked about the big groups, but even if it's a a low splintering, I'm A versus B, I'm this versus that. And by creating what he says, these cliques inside of the church, it will tear people apart. It reminds me of this joke. There's a comedian called Emo Phillips, who I've seen a couple of times, and he's a hoot. He's a kind of an interesting guy, but he tells this joke that this man comes across this other man who's about to jump on the bridge, and he says, don't do it, don't do it. And then the other man's like, oh, nobody loves me. 
And so then the other guy says, no, no, no. Do you believe in God? God loves you. And so then the guy says, yes, I do believe in God. So he questions him, are you a Christian or are you Jewish? I'm a Christian. Me too. Are you a Protestant or a Catholic? He says, I'm a Protestant. You know what? Me too. You know, which type of Christian are you? I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist too. And they keep going. Northern Baptist versus Southern Baptist. The Northern Conservative Baptist versus the Northern Liberal Baptist. And we keep going, you know, down to all these different groups. And finally, the guy says, oh, well, I'm part of the Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And the guy looks at him and shoves him off the bridge. Die, heretic. And I pushed him over. We get into these fights and into these clicks like this. It's a joke in this particular comedy act. But is it? Because that's exactly what we do. We go to these extents to create clicks, what they said in this church, what C.S. Lewis called in this church, and that can cause us to break fellowship, be against each other. And again, it's that A versus B thing again, but we can't maybe do A versus B. So instead, we'll go 13 different steps down the line until we find a splinter there. A lot of times in this book, they scoff at whether or not God really loves these terrible little creatures. And of course, God does love us. And that's the problem. This isn't some fake love. This isn't some type of a weird cult that God has for us. This is actual love. God really cares about us. And that's part of what confounds these devils, these demons all the time. And in fact, it says he wants to create little miniature replicas of God. God wants us to be like God. He still wants us to be us. We are created unique individuals with likes and dislikes. But if we can take that and use it in a way that God would be served and we would be like God too, that's going to make the world so much better. And that's what confounds these demons because we are trying to become sons and daughters of God We are sons and daughters of God, but the demons want to make sure that we don't understand that at all. We want to be broken into tiny little fighting groups. He says that at this point, the man has been a Christian for a while and says that what you can do is go through what they call the trough of dullness and dryness, which means, you know, sometimes we're just not feeling it, right? There are some days we feel close to God. We feel his presence in our lives. And then there are days where maybe we just don't. And if the demons can get us to feel that dullness, that lack of relationship with God, that I'm just not feeling it today kind of thing, and bring in all the emotions that are with that, that's where we can get split away from God. That if we can then start thinking, well, maybe God's not true. Maybe from a historical point of view, or the historical Jesus was a nice person, tried to do good things. This is more of about a man who tried to do some good things and now we're blowing him out of proportion. This is a really modern, intellectual way at looking at God. And you'll see people say that. Oh, Jesus was a great guy. It's just his followers I can't talk to. I think Gandhi said something to that extent. But the point of it is, is that even Gandhi wasn't a perfect human being and had a lot of flaws. The point is we all have flaws and that God forgives us for that. But we want to be modern. We want to be splintered off. And so some days, if we're just not feeling that attachment with God, we can be diverted into this historical Jesus, or the principles of Christianity are good. It's just that the people in the church just aren't that good. And that's how we can get split off to being closer to God, by thinking about how we're not like those other people. We're not Puritans. We're not this. We're not that. And we're smarter than that. And we'll use that spiritual dryness or when we're just not feeling close to God to indicate to us that maybe that God thing was a phase. Maybe we're just in a different situation now where we just don't really need God. We'll take the good things out. That's fine. But we just don't have to do all the things. And so then what you get, he says, is that the person, the man, will be living a parallel life. Sure, he'll go to church on Sunday, maybe. But he'll be going out with his friends, telling jokes. Maybe he'll tell some dirty jokes. Maybe he'll do some things that are more modern, less intolerant. Because I'm not one of those Christians. I'm a different kind of Christian. I'm the kind of Christian who is modern 
and intellectual. And so he's living what they call the two lives. Go to church, pray to God, go to communion, sit next to his brothers and sisters in Christ, and then mock them, put them down, belittle them as inferior or intellectually stupid when he's out with his friends, and then just keep him from reading the Bible, praying, doing the things that brings us closer to God. Work is busy. I need to sleep in. I need to do this and that. And that will drive us away from God just by sheer busyness and the fact that, you know, I know I'm a Christian, but I'm, I'm one of the good Christians who's super smart, not like the other Christians. And that's what the devils are trying to get him to do is get that split, not just between churches and groups and A versus B, but it's actually trying to split the person in two. This is my Sunday me. This is the me that I smile and shake hands with my neighbors at church. And then this is the other me, the, the regular me that makes fun of them when I go to work. Oh, no, no, I'm not one of those Christians. I'm a, I'm a different kind of Christian. And now we're even split within our own being. He says that what you'll be able to do is then get them away with thoughts of lust or superiority. He says that murder is not really better to do because, you know, that's a big turn for someone. It's easy to be more gentle, to get into what they call, quote, the soft underfoot without any sudden turnings. And he says, quote, murder is no better than cards, playing cards, you know, gambling, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. Even the devil thinks of small steps. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, and without signposts. You know, that's the easiest way to get lost in the woods is just to sort of gently divert into the wrong direction. Take the wrong turn. Take the left turn instead of the right turn. And in those small steps, we can get closer to God. That's what this whole podcast is about. But we can also get closer to the devil, too, just by taking small steps, just by not noticing that we're going away from him. So keep in mind that a good idea is being used by both sides. God wants us into small steps to walk with him. So do the demons. And he says, you know, catch him in those times when he's, quote, poor in spirit, when he's even being a little bit humble or even a little bit quiet and give him pride. Make him have that pride in himself and all the things that he does. And I thought that this was interesting because pride is one of the deadly sins. We're seeing today that everyone is trying to talk us into pride. Be proud. Be loud. Stand up for yourself. Pride. Pride days. We have pride all over the place. And it's funny because when you talk to people about, I think, other sins, when it comes to murder, or if you think about sleeping with another person outside your marriage, those are some pretty major sins, and they're easy to get to. And that's why he was saying, if a playing cards on a Friday night will take him away from God, don't bother with the big sins. But it's the same thing here, too. Pride is the deadliest of sins. In fact, the, the quote is, pride cometh before the fall. That You always see that in TV shows, right? You got this guy, and he's committing the crime of the century, and he stands up and goes, ha, ha, ha. I just robbed the bank, you know, and then he's taking pride of it. You know he's about to get caught or about to fall off or something's going to happen to him. Pride is a sin, and it does us so much harm to be proud, but it is so easy to take a bit of humility and make us proud. Maybe we're even proud of our humility, but it's weird because as we see sins become Oh, that's boring. That's old. Sin doesn't matter. Going against God doesn't matter. It's really hard to debate against pride. You can tell where pride brings you away. But what's weird in our society is that's exactly what we're doing now. Now we're telling people pride is good. And it's really the number one way that causes our downfall. Pride is dangerous. Remember, pride is discussed as a stalking lion. Pride in the Garden of Eden was the very first sin. I know better than God knows. Pride is what brought down 
the angel Lucifer and brought about the fall of angels, made devils in the first place. In 1 Timothy, pride is called the snare of the devil. It means it grabs our foot, right? A snare is a trap. So we think we're walking along the path and suddenly something reaches out and grabs our foot. That's a snare. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what the day may bring. That's Proverbs 27.1. We are not supposed to have pride. And in this book, the devils writing each other recognize that pride is the snare of the devil. And so then you can make sure that when he takes in pride and looks at himself, he's not looking at the past. He's not looking at his present self. He sees himself as glorious, as amazing, as evolved. And so when we get that pride, it starts building in with ambition and then starts making him look like, again, better than the people he goes to church with, better than the people are around him, better than God. I know better than everyone. So pride is dangerous. And it's interesting that pride seems to be the thing that society seems to be fighting for more than anything now. And he says that, quote, you will say that some of these sins are very small. And doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wicked deeds, right? They want the big deeds. They want the murders and the affairs and marriage. Instead, those little sins, those quiet sins, are what really gets us the most. We don't seek forgiveness. We don't forgive ourselves. We use our energy to start defending our actions and defending what we believe. It's not a sin. I'm in the right here. He talks about the dangers of gluttony. And he brought up an interesting point. When was the last time we ever thought about gluttony? I saw the statistic that 40% of Americans are overweight. We don't think of that of being a dangerous sin at all. But he says that it'll be different for women than men. But in the end, gluttony is a dangerous for both people. And he even talks about gluttony as being someone who is just proud or has vanity about the meal they're eating or the things that they have. This is the best steak in town. This is the best meal. I'm taking my wife out to the best restaurant. That it's not so much about the quantity of the food that's being eaten. It's about, again, the pride in the food that's being eaten. And so whether it's gluttony or pride, it's a danger to us that we're doing it. And he's absolutely right. I have not heard of a good sermon that talked about gluttony ever, I think, in my life, but it is there as something that we have to watch out for. Then he talks about this concept of love. We like love. We want to be in love. But instead of that actual love of a marriage where it talks about being one flesh, of being brought together by God, instead, society and these demons talk about love as being this, eh, it's an emotion, right? It's lust, it's fun, it's enjoyable, it's having that um, music video kind of love. But you know what? Even that gets boring and dull and loses interest after a while. Instead of what we think about being in love with little hearts in our eyes, instead, it's about sticking it out and being together in a partnership and being respectful of loving each other in the good days and the bad and in sickness and in health. I've seen divorces happen when someone got sick, but you were supposed to be with that person through everything. So instead, what these demons are doing are messing up the terms of love even, debating whether marriage matters or celibacy matters. We don't have that love that they had when the person originally got married. Now we fell out of love. And that's not what God intends for us. God is meant to be forever. God meant marriage to be a partnership, a union of souls, helpers that are helping each other and being through everything together, that there was no divorce. There's no reason to split from each other because love is eternal and is built on the framework of God. So in the end of the book, what happens is, is that the man gets a girlfriend and, oh no, she's a Christian. And that is what brings his faith into a stronger place. He has now someone to be in faith with him. He has someone to help bind his faith together. 
Remember where it talks about in the Bible where two or three come together, where you're trying to be strong together. The Bible talks about friendship or that marriage relationship all the time. Ecclesiastes 4.9 says, Two are better than one because they have good returns for their labor. It means that people are going to do more together. They're going to stick together. And in this case, the demons are horrified that he has a girlfriend because now his faith is going to be tied up with someone else. This relationship with the woman is destructive from the demon's point of view. So their thought is that this has to go away. She has to go away. That this love relationship cannot be. And that Bible passage that talks about not yoking with unbelievers, it sounds like a very harsh phrase. What it means is that what a yoke did is that if you had two oxen and you put a yoke around them, the two oxen worked together to plow the field. But if you have one ox that is very strong and one ox that is very weak, it is going to tear down the strong ox and not really help the weak ox and the field won't get plowed at all. It's not talking about the fact we shouldn't be around people who aren't believers. It's saying that if we have a work to do, that it is best that we are working with people who are on our level. And when we're getting married, we're talking about someone who has faith. Their faith will help bring us through together. Their faith will bind with ours, and we'll be stronger for that. And so in the very end, they lost the man. The man gained his faith and stuck with the woman he met and their faith together made them strong. And that was the end of this fight to sort of drag this away from God. And so then the book ended, and the demons' letters to each other ended as well. I thought that it was such a potent message that was in the screw tape letters. It was a lot bigger of a book than I remember it being. I thought it was a little tiny book, but it was so thick with ideas. But what we have to remember is the power of prayer. When the demons try to take us away from prayer and communion with other people in our church, that should be a sign we should be doing that more. When demons are trying to make us prideful or trying to make us lack humility, we should be doing that more. And when the demons are telling us that love is just an emotion, faith is just an emotion, we should actually be looking at the kind of love for our spouses, for the people that we may marry or for the friends around us, as not an emotion, but something that binds us together. And then we have to remember that in the end, this fight between good and evil is for our very souls. And when we talk about breaking up into groups, hating other people, and not being children of God together, but instead being modern or prideful or not like those other people, what we're doing is we're tearing down the very parts of the church that we need to be bringing up. As the one true source of everything that matters the most, we are to rely on God and be with him through all things thick or thin. It's not about emotion. It's about binding. So my challenge to you is think about the things that if there were demons writing letters about you, what would they write about? What would they talk about when they talked about you? And see if that might not be a place where you can start putting some strategies in places to get away from that. Are you fighting A versus B? Are you proud or just plain stubborn or even vain? Find out what those things are and see if you can struggle against it. You know, I know that when I was thinking about this book and thinking about the things that were particularly in my way, I know that the one that got me the most was probably one of the smaller points in the book. But if you can just make the person busy or tired, or I really need to go get lunch, you can divert a person away from God, that you can take the time that is meant to be with God, the prayer that's meant to be with God, and steal it away just by eating away at time. That was the lesson for me, but think about it for you. And remember that getting away from the demons in our life and moving towards God can be attained by taking small steps. 